what do you believe right now that's making you feel this way? And when you analyse it, you realise how irrational you can be at times. Every single one of our major customers and minor customers all shut their doors overnight. It's not sales per se, but the outcome of it is because people get to know you, they get to see you. But, you know, what's the culture like at the business? What do what do we stand for, the values? I've got to tick that box on my personal development programme for the... I don't really want to be here. Scaling up a business isn't easy. If it were, we wouldn't have less than 4% of businesses scaling beyond 10 employees or around a million pound turnover level and less than 1% beyond 50 employees. But the contribution that we make as owner managers to our economies is immense and should never be underestimated. Yet it can be a tough gig for all of us at times. And only other business owners truly understand the challenges that we face. And through Scale Up Radio, we aim to help make things a little easier. We interview guests who have been where you are now and may have faced some of the challenges that you are facing. And they offer their thoughts and advice on what has worked for them, as well as what didn't. And we've also combined many of the lessons from these interviews and also through working with hundreds of owner managers over the last 10 years or so into a practical scale up handbook that we've called the Entrepreneurial Scale Up System or ESAS. And it's for owner managers like you and me as we navigate our own scale up journey. And you can order a copy through your favorite online book retailer or by going to all the W's, esasgroup.co.uk, www esusgroup.co.uk So welcome to another episode of Scale Up Radio and this is a great discussion I have with Chris Cook and Chris is the founder and MD of Chantry and they work in the franchise industry and specifically around helping franchisors to find more franchisees but they also help the franchisees of those franchisors to find more clients. Are you confused yet? Certainly can get a bit tricky with all of these, the differences between franchisors and franchisees but essentially they're helping both sides of the franchise industry. And they're also then helping with franchise resales and valuations. So all of this discussion is, is specifically around the franchise industry. But of course, there's such a range of businesses within the franchise world, many of them household names that you may in fact not realise are franchises, that, that this has so many lessons for us in all the industries that we might be in. And franchising is a fascinating industry to be a part of. And we talk a little bit about some of the reasons why a business may want to franchise itself, but also perhaps why people might want to buy into a franchise. And of course, if you want to find out why Chris's dog, Jeff, was so instrumental in the setting up of the business, then you're going to need to listen to the episode. And of course, we talk about Chantry's own scale up journey, and he's been doing this since about 2006, 2007, and he's gone through many different stages. Like many of us, perhaps, he started off with a, an outsourced model, and then he looked at moving to having it office-based, and he's grown from there. But also, there's a key point at which he realised that the value of hiring good people essentially that are better than him or certainly the importance of hiring really good people and being prepared to invest in them. And we talked also a bit about the culture within the business and how Chris feels that that is so important to him and one of the differentiators with Chantry between him and his competitors. So there's lots of things that we talk about within this episode and I know that you're going to get a huge amount of value from it. So I encourage you very much to listen to this episode with Chris Cook, who is the founder and MD of Chantry. So Chris, welcome. Hello, Kevin. Good. And tell us, what's, what, is, what is Chantry all about? Um, so we help people in the franchise industry, franchisors and their franchisees. Uh, we help them grow their businesses primarily. Uh, we help them uh, in terms of the number of franchisees, so attracting more of the right type of people to become franchisees, to build their own businesses. So we help with the marketing and the recruitment to help them grow and help the network grow and expand. Primarily in the UK, we do work with clients internationally, but primarily in the UK. Um, we also... Um, 
We also help with the the the, uh, the the franchisee when they're growing their business. So we help with the marketing and the growth of the franchisee's okay. business. So we work with the franchisor on the franchisee yeah. at that stage of their journey. Uh, and then when they get towards the end of their journey, shall we say, uh, the exit stage, um, preparing for exit, we help with the valuation, preparing the mindset, preparing the business, um, and then finding a buyer and helping that franchisee exit, finding the right type of individual to come in uh, to replace them so the franchisor is happy and the network continues growing uh, in the direction the franchisor is obviously looking to, to take it. So what are some of the, so there's, so, yeah, so there's three key key areas there. What are, what are some of the key challenges then that you, that you solve for, for business? I mean, you mentioned finding franchisees. Why is that so, why is that so difficult for a franchisor? He says tongue in cheek. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been doing it since 2007. So we've worked with quite a few different companies over that time uh, and seen quite a few uh, stages, shall we say, in the economic cycles. Finding the right franchisees can be very tough. And I, unfortunately, I've come across quite a few franchisors who, who have approached it um, using different methodologies, shall we say. Uh, and they may have done very, very, very well at attracting people and getting the uh, the initial um, fee off that, that those individuals and, and then unfortunately if you get the wrong people in with the wrong expectations you can actually it can cost a lot more money uh, mm. if you get it wrong and it actually everyone gets worried about how much it's going to cost to grow a business and investing in marketing and oh I might waste some um, with franchise recruitment if you get the wrong franchisees it costs you a hell of a lot more and it's pretty scary and some of the stories that I've heard have been pretty um, uh, interesting, shall we say, and I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. So I, I would say if you're going to grow a franchise network, just do it calmly, properly, spend the time to work out who you want and who's going to be successful. Because when you get a franchisee in, it's their, they're investing their possibly life savings. They're probably borrowing a lot of money as well. Um, and if they've got the wrong expectations and they don't succeed, um, for 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 um, reasons that they've been potentially missold, uh, it can get particularly um, messy and expensive for all parties involved. This isn't like selling widgets; we're selling something that really matters to people. Yeah. Um, selling is probably the wrong word. It's uh, it's about finding the right people and matchmaking. Um, so we we spend a hell of a lot of time and focus um, on um, the people that we're trying to attract and making sure the message is correct uh, for the. Um, for the, for the franchise or to attract the right sort of people to their network. Um, and it's, as I say, absolutely critical to get the right sorts of people. I mean, obviously people get it wrong, but if you've got most of it right, you're in a very strong position. If you've got mm -hmm. most of it wrong, you're in a, well, you might not have a franchise for much longer. <clears throat> and and so why is it something that as a franchise or we don't just, just do our do ourselves? Why, why would we need to, to bring you in? Oh, some do. And uh, we work with some brands who we help advise where they've got their own in-house team. So uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not the only person that does this in the world. I'm not the only person that, uh, or the team, I should say, that, that, that's capable. Um, no, there's some very good people out there that, that do do it within, within, the, uh, within the businesses, but you're obviously only working with a very small number of minds in that situation. And then those people will probably have uh, some agencies that they work with or the franchise all have some agencies that are used to doing marketing and, and recruitment in their sphere, which is not normally um, specialist to franchise recruitment. So they, they tend to do a lot of testing, shall we say, with you as the guinea pig and you can waste a lot of money. Uh, we often pick up people who have gone down that route and it might be that the person in house is, is, is really good at, for example, the recruitment piece. So they're good at talking to people. They're good at taking those people um, on the journey from when they've inquired to becoming a franchisee. So they explain really well. They understand the detail of the business model and what's involved in being successful. So that might be really good, but they might not really understand marketing, producing um, regular content, where to put the money to get the inquiries for them from the types of people that they want to attract. And um, so there's many, many areas to franchise recruitment. And I'm not the one that wears all the hats. I've got a team of people with all the little areas of expertise. Um, and because we're doing this for quite a while, we bring them together and, and form a little team for that client. Okay. So the client then has exactly what they need around what they've got as a resource already. Um, so it works really well. And we tend to have, uh, even though we don't tie people in, we tend to have very long relationships with our clients, many, many years. Um, and it's very rewarding for all parties because obviously if we're, we're only winning if the, if the client is winning. So the fact that they stick with us, tend to stick with us for quite a long period, typically many years, as I say, um, it's, uh, it's good. If everyone's, as I say, it's mutually beneficial relationship. 
So is that is that one of the things that you do differently from from maybe some of your competitors, or, or what would what would you say separates Chantry from your peers? Um, well, we're uh, we're quite a weird one because we, we obviously have this marketing agency element to us where we're producing the messaging and, and, and creating um, the sort of the strategy, if you like. Um, we also have the piece around the marketing for the franchisees as another strand of the business. And we've also got the resales and evaluations. Mm. Um, and it's difficult. There isn't really that many people that are competitors to us as a business because of the fact that we've got all these different areas and the, all this expertise in-house. Um, so there's people that I could say are potentially a competitor to the individual strands of that, yeah. but there's yeah. very few, again, competitors in those individual strands. So as an entity, we are sort of quite unique in a way. Um, and I, I, I obviously dealing with marketing and trying to find people's unique selling points and differentiators on a daily basis. It's, it's you know, I, I know roughly what, I, what I'm saying about, you know, what's unique and what is just a, just a, a, a differentiator. But no, our team is is incredibly well regarded um, by those in the franchise industry um, who, who've been around for a while. Got some absolute heroes uh, and her- and heroines, is that the right word, right term? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're we're very lucky with the people that we've we've got got well, I've got around me, um, and and that having being able to get in get those people or those the time and the expertise from those people as a group of people to help you um, is, is very very powerful. So in terms of what differentiates us, I'd say we've been around for a long time. We've got a proven process which we've proved with multiple different franchise brands. Um, we started in 2017 with this process. So it's been, I mean, we obviously tweaked it and refined it, but since 2017, we've proved it with brands of all shapes and sizes, targeting all different types of um, franchise prospects. We've also used it with the customer side and it's it's worked fantastically. We call it the breakthrough process. Okay. Um, I suspect other people will say they've got amazing, unique processes as well, but we're talking about my our process at the moment. So yep. um, no, we've used it with the likes of Shell Energy, who um, are, are sort of the biggest client that we um, currently have on the books at the moment. Uh, and then we've worked with smaller brands when they're just first starting out and evolving. Um, window cleaning, um, uh, all sorts of different things. I've been to bank to the number, but um, we've worked with uh, tuition type businesses, all sorts of people coming into the UK marketplace from America or from Spain or okay. Australia. We've, we've, we've bought one in from Australia uh, who were cold into the UK, market, big, biggest in the world, but they weren't in the UK. So we helped them launch in the UK, this particular franchise network. And no grow. So we we've got a very good process, which um, I'm um, I'm not the sort of person that fluffs things. I fluff all day long with marketing purposes, but I, I, I'm very straight with what I say. So if I'm saying it's a it's a proven process, you you, you are pretty confident that what I'm saying is correct. Uh, yeah. No, it's, it's a good process. So in terms of differentiators, we've got as I say the time we've been around, our level of expertise, the team we've got in place, the um, process that we follow is also another one I would add to the to the mix. I like to think we're quite fair on our pricing as well, uh, very transparent. So we don't mark up, we don't charge commissions on any of the, mati- of the things we're booking for a client. So we're genuinely independent. So if you were to work with us, we would um, we would be seen as part of your team rather than an agency coming in and trying to sell you stuff. So okay. it's a different relationship, which is why we have that longer relationship with clients, in my opinion. Yeah, very good. And what sort of stage are you at in terms of your, your journey as a, 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 as a business can you give us a, a, a flavor for your for where you are um so in terms of scale we are uh very i'm very proud to say we're we're approaching a million in in turnover um uh each month fluctuates a little bit but we're at that sort of level now um just just under but uh um yeah it's been a very interesting few years so um the covid's put a lot of pressure on the industry because a lot of yeah. people suddenly were working from home uh, and, and uh, there's a lot of uncertainty as to whether it was the right time to start a business um, and franchising um, certain, or I should say certain areas of franchising have absolutely flown as a result of, of the, uh, the situation and other areas of franchising, it's been tough. Uh, and primarily the areas that I've seen that have been most tough have been um, uh, sort of the more the white collar, the consultancy, the the corporates who have still they've had the security uh, and the money still coming in. They're working from home or doing a bit now. If they're returning, doing a bit in the office and a bit from home, so they've really had they've not had to make that move that they would have done previously to get the lifestyle change, to see the family more, and to travel less and to avoid the commuting misery. So um, I think the industry is still 
uh, waiting to fully recover from it. From that perspective, there's there's a load of people out there who are still thinking about it. They're still inquiring. But they're not necessarily making their move at this point in time is what we're seeing. So the inquiries are good, but getting the conversion is is, is tougher on those on those particular um, audiences. But but uh, other audiences in, for example, home care, it's all very logical, really. Um, home yeah. improvements was very good as well through that period. Um, so a lot of people were like, oh, well, this is a very sound business model because everyone wants it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you mentioned it. you mentioned a lot of sectors there, and it often, you know, it, well, let's say often, it never ceases to amaze me the range of uh, types of businesses that can be that, that can be in our in our franchise. Why should a, a business think about franchising? Um, well, in my opinion, I mean, obviously, I tend to deal with the, them when they've got to the point where they are franchise in, okay. and they're, and they're, yeah. they're um, you know, they've gone through the process with a franchise a franchise consultant, and that's an area you need to be very careful, from my experience, in choosing a proper franchise consultant, BFA, British Franchise Association, um, authorised, endorsed, and also checking that you click and connect with them, because if you get that bit wrong, you, your model isn't right, then recruiting for that model, you're bringing it to just all... Set up setting out on the wrong mm. journey, and it's possibly more expensive than an internet search would let on. So there's right. certain individuals out there um, who are who are promoting very low cost routes into franchising your business. So be very very careful because I unfortunately see the the bit when they come out the other side. They've spent uh, some money um, uh, thinking they've got a bit of a, a deal. Possibly uh, this is the franchise or or want to be franchise or would be franchise yeah. or and. Uh, uh, and then maybe I'll go going in the right direction. But uh, in terms of uh, franchising a business, it's a very good way uh, if you do get it right and put everything in place uh, of, of scaling across across the country. So from a scale up perspective, Kevin, yeah. um, it's uh, it, it's a good way, in my opinion, a very good way um, of getting your business from a, a local presence or a regional presence to a national maybe then international and then even further afield in terms of a sort of a global footprint. And there's yeah. some phenomenal stories, uh, success stories out there. Um, uh, anytime fitness, water babies, um, McDonald's, um, Costa. I mean, you, there's a lot of foodie ones, um, but there's also a lot of um, uh, uh, Dino Rod, uh, probably British Gas, um, uh, there's carpet cleaning. There's, it's it's yeah. amazing. You, the you, range yes, and scale of franchised businesses yeah, exactly. is staggering. And they've done better from what I can see. Uh, this is a, a view rather than a, a scientific yeah. fact, uh, the work, what I'm saying now. I think they've done better through the, through the pandemic and the economic turmoil because you've got a group of people who are all working together to make sure that each person survives for the good of the whole, uh, for the network. And um, I personally think it's, a, it's done right. It's a very, very strong business a way of developing, growing, scaling up your business. Great. So what are some, so you kind of covered some of these there, but you know, if I was to say, well, you know, what do you, what do you love about what you do? Um, what, sort, what, what, what sort of things would you come up with there? Um, I don't know whether I've ever answered any of your questions so far directly. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, I tend to go on a little tangent first. Um, the direct answer is I really want to help people, um, and those the, the way I want to help people is is in the, in the way I'm doing it now is, is business owners. I want to help business owners. I want to help them feel that they've succeeded. So there's a personal reward for them and them saying thank you. I want those people to make more money, um, and I would ideally like to have a situation where there's a mutual journey together where everyone's benefiting and everyone's making more money. That's the yeah. ideal. I started out, probably should have been a teacher. Most of my family are teachers. Yeah, okay. uh, I enjoy training. I enjoy helping. Um, I don't think I was meant to do it with children. I love children. I've got children. I've got three kids myself. Um, lovely wife, lovely family. I'm very, very lucky. Everyone's very happy. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a, I'm very fortunate in the, in the world I live in. Um, but equally, I want other people to, to be happy and to, to, to develop and grow and, and be prosperous and have a, okay. a nice lifestyle. Um, that right. doesn't necessarily mean millions of pounds. It just means a fulfilling, great. rewarding life. Yeah, great. So those are some of the things you, you love. What, what, what frustrates you about the, about the industry? Oh goodness! I can't say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I doubt I'll be able to listen to. Um, uh, what frustration about the industry? I think that there is a lot that could be done to improve and keep um, 
to, to protect more franchisors, I think is probably the right way of saying it without trying to get anyone in trouble. Um, fran- so, so people coming into franchising, they need to follow the best practice. They need to right. work with the right people, not pay the wrong people to get yeah. poor advice. And, and you can't, in my opinion, package a business with a cheap five, six grand legal um, contract and franchise manual and every, it just you can't it, it, the legal fees alone i don't so, know from your experience but that's five or six grand in my experience yeah. um as a minimum so i think for me it's bringing people in and having their expectations set correctly over the, the journey ahead so that they are successful when they bring people in when i say bring people in the franchise all brings people in the franchisees in and those franchisees are then set up to be successful because it's all about the success of the franchisee paying the franchisor. If those franchisees are successful, the franchisor should be successful. We should be successful as the advisor and supporter of the process. So um, that's how franchising should be. And I I, I think that's, if, if there was, and there's always in every industry, there's going to be good and bad. So I yeah. have to be careful. So, the people not doing it, not doing it properly, not know. doing it right and properly. It doesn't have to be with me, but just not yeah. doing it right and properly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, good. So, what um, what got you into in, into this in the first place? Take us back to when you started Chantry. Why did you Why did you do that? Um, so, the original driver was around. Well, actually, being very honest, it was a dog. I was living in London, working in London with the partner at the time where we um, wanted to get a dog and that needed us to have a different lifestyle. You can't go into an office in London. And, well, you can, but it, I don't think it's fair on the, yeah. on the app. And uh, the, the lifestyle, I've, I've grew up in the countryside and wanted to live in the countryside. So the whole thing was about finding a way of working uh, with my own um, control, own parameters and, and having... The dog, which happened to be a dog called Jess, there's a picture of her up there. She's uh, unfortunately disappeared now, gone off to to wherever dogs go. Um, right. And uh, yeah, but no, that was that was the original reason, and, and to help people. So it was a combination of um, selfishness from a lifestyle perspective, um, but also to to try and to try and help um, and and, and um, help business owners, which is where I decided I was heading. So I still am. <laughs> when was that then that you that, that you started? So uh, 2006, it was incorporated in 2007. So 2006 was when it started. And then, and then since then, we've gone through various different iterations and different ways to scale and grow. Okay. Which is probably where you're heading me next anyway. Yes, I'd um, love to explore some of those. Yeah, so we've tried um, what you would class as a consultant on, on a commission structure where they sort of hold and own the client, which didn't really work. It was fine, but it didn't really work. And it kept coming back to... So, you know, me basically having to sort out what was going on and keep it all spinning. We've um, we've tried, uh, so that had a bit of a, a, a presence to it. So we would work from home, they would work from home, and it, it was geographically spread. Uh, so this was back in, in sort of 2010, probably, a bit before maybe, 2008, eight nine. Um, so we, 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 we tried that for a period. Um, uh, I think some of those individuals are still in franchising, so I have to be a little bit careful what I say. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, we then went, uh, we then went on to, well, I, I, I basically thought, right, let's go local. Let's, I want an office, and went through that phase of needing to have an office and have a team in an office. And, and, and I say it in a negative way, but for me, it was a negative because um, you can only recruit from that pool around the office, mm-hmm. and, yeah. and for the industry sector that we're in and the skill set we need. Uh, it isn't. It wasn't the right move. So we did that for a few years, and and uh, from a lifestyle perspective, it was it was you know interesting cycling in, um, having a shower, go to the office, um, and uh, um, having some people there and physically seeing them every day, and it being you know a little sort of there's a bit of a culture to that, which was which was quite pleasant in a way. Um, I don't think I we I was more efficient. I think I'm more efficient working from a home office personally. I don't think they were more efficient. Some of them stayed with me for many, many years. Um, one of the ladies worked for me for 11, 11 and a half years. So she's mm. been through various stages in that journey, as you can imagine, over that period. So in terms of scaling up, I don't think that was the right move for us, me. Um, and we were still small. We only had it was four or five of us. It was a small team team. Um, mm. Uh, and as I said, the quality of some of those staff, they were they were uh, uh, not quite the level, nowhere near the level we've got now in the business. I then went through a moment, you know, I remember just thinking, I need to do this differently. And I just decided that I had to 
trust people to work from home. And I wanted to employ the most, I suddenly went from being a cheapskate and trying to always do things cost effectively is a better word. Uh, And always worrying about paying, you know, doing this consultant arrangements and always trying to make it as safe as possible for me, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, never getting the right people because you weren't, they weren't really committed to me and, and the business. They were, you know, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. So I, I went through this phase and thought, right, blow this. And uh, he won't mind me saying, but it was the arrival of Paul Stafford that was the changing point. And Mr. Paul Stafford uh, formerly worked at the BFA and um, had been there for quite a few years. And I think he was ready for a change and there was various things going on politically there. So he, he moved to Chantry at the time. It was the right thing for, for him and for us. And uh, that was the moment, you know, I paid Paul. We'd probably thinking, oh, it's some cut price of salary. But at the time, <laughs> I was paying Paul the most I'd ever imagined paying anyone. Uh, yeah. And looking back, it probably wasn't very much um, compared to, to what we're paying these paying people today but um it was a big move for me so it was mm. go and find this was this is my top tip if you like yeah. go and find the best people you can who are respected who um you can work with um who, who've got a, a voice and an opinion and get them part of your team and make them part of your team by um finding ways to 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 um bind them to the business and to yourself through the culture, through the remuneration strategy, um, all sorts of different ways. So um, I can talk about that if you want to a little bit. Um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting a point. As well. I think it's a really interesting um, point because we often go through that, you know, should we, you know, should we hire two or three junior people and, and train them up? Or should we, as you say, should we go for uh, somebody that's more, a bit more of a heavyweight, more expensive, um, but we can only probably afford to have one of them. And even, and even then, you know, how do we make sure that we're confident that actually, because we're kind of putting a lot of eggs in that basket, you know, what, so what did you, what gave you the confidence to hire Paul then? What, um, what, 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 yeah, what, what what did you put in place, or or what what was your thinking to try and make sure that you got that right? Um, I think I'd probably got to a point where I was like, I'm not doing this like this anymore. I think I'd got to that stage where I was like, I can't keep doing it like this. It's not, you know, I've been doing it for a long time at that stage. Um, there was some. I was probably gaining more respect and gaining more confidence with some of the bigger names and bigger people in franchising as well. So I was starting to get to a point where I was like, I can't keep messing around, doing these little things and doing it myself as well. I was trying to, I was really genuinely determined to start the scale up journey. Yeah. Definitely haven't scaled up yet, but definitely start the scale up journey. I don't know when I'll say I have, but hopefully I will do Kevin to you in a couple of years time. (laughs) Um, No, I mean, back in those days we were, we were tiny and there was a few people, the money was tiny. I wasn't making a lot of money from it. I was doing a lot of virtual marketing director type roles as well Mm -hmm. alongside it, which were paying me to, to live and I had um, other bits and pieces going on. So um, it wasn't really, it was, I was genuinely helping businesses. That was, it was not really a fina- massive financial gain from it. Not that there is a massive financial gain right now, but um, we we're certainly a different animal to what we were uh, back then. We were, you know, billing a very small amount of money each month um, and, and helping very few people. So deciding to help more people and wanting more people to help those people it, it was really a quite a case of going out and finding the right people. Once I found those people, it, it was then just stepping stones. Really, the next person to join was was Nikki, um, and then and then after that Richard. And we we just, I mean I can remember the, the the steps. I can remember the people. It gets more fuzzy as we get nearer now, ironically, because there's so we've got we've speeded up um, okay. uh, in in that journey. But once once it started to feel right, it, it, it sped up, and now we've got to a stage where. Um, I, I guess we we're at a stage where it's um, it, it's it's me. I have to let go of it now. I've got to let them do it, and it's mm. it's me passing over everything and letting people. I can still provide value. I can still help with various bits, but everyone's better than me at all these things. So I now need to let them do it, and I now need to 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 the next journey. The next step in the journey is really exciting because it's I am doing what I set out to do. I'm helping a lot more people than I can help. Mm. myself yes. which was what i wanted to achieve from this uh making a few more pounds than i was as well but not nowhere near where you know people would scale as as successful so um um I, I, we've got a long way to go but but at the moment we're, we're helping a lot more people and um uh this mantra of finding the best people or this philosophy of finding the best people and bringing them in and 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 
the culture we've got is so lovely. The people are joining because of the culture and they hear about the culture because it's a small industry. So when you're looking for the next person, it just, it, you know, people so have you, about us already. How have you developed that, that culture then? And how do, you, how do you keep that as you now take on more people? We've had a few that haven't quite worked out. So it hasn't all been plain sailing. And I think some of that has been down to the economy as well with COVID, because that really did impact us and put a lot of pressure on the business. Um, so although we've grown quite significantly, it's it's been a pressured period. Uh, mm. It hasn't been much fun. I haven't enjoyed it as much as, as I am again now and have done previously. So we, well, I've, I'm, as you can probably tell, my focus is on helping business owners, helping people. Mm. Um, yes, we need to be paid for the help, but the focus is on that. So when someone joins Chantry, they are coming into a group of people that all care about the end result. And that care is one of the things that I guess you you subconsciously recruit people who right. fit with that that mindset of caring for. And mm. it, it, it can be quite hard to find people because some people, there's just not, they're not wired like that. That's not how they operate or how they think. But we're very lucky that we have got a team who do tick that box. Um, and uh, I think that the atmosphere in Chantry is, is very, we look after each other, we look after the client, everyone seems to be looking out for everybody else and it, it just, it works. There's a few that haven't quite stuck with it. You know, as I said, there's, there's been some that have come and gone. We had an amazing record where we hadn't actually lost anyone till I think it was about the end, it was around the sort of the end of the, the Omicron bit and then we we had a bit of churn. But we'd, we'd had a period where for five years or four or five years, we had, we'd only grown and we hadn't really yeah. had any churn uh, for that period, which was someone pointed out to me and it was like, yeah, that is a bit weird. Yeah, very good. <laughs> in a good way. Yeah. In a good yeah. way. Um, yeah. And we're not, um, unfortunately, we're not in a position because we haven't got loads of money because we don't charge the clients tons of money. Um, we, some might say otherwise. <laughs> but no, we, we, we're very fair with our pricing and uh, well, I feel we are. And the, we can't pay what I'd like to pay the staff. So there has to be some other reasons why they want to work for Chantry. Do you see yeah. what I mean? It's, it's not just purely financial. There is definitely other reasons why they like working as part of the business. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Very good. So certainly then one of the key things you'd say you got right then was, was hiring the right people, the, you know, the key, um, key, key, key people. Um, what what other things would you say you've got right along the uh, along the way? Key milestones, things that things that things that made a difference. I think the biggest one is sticking with this theory that you've got to make sure you're giving value to the client on okay. an ongoing basis because you haven't got a business. Well, this business is built around providing ongoing value, yeah. continually trying to help that client succeed, and. With marketing, some things work and some things don't work. But you can, if you're always checking and always measuring and always under pressure, which we are, we need to keep providing value to that client, those clients, all the clients. And it's not just the franchisor; it's the franchisees. It's um, we work with with advisors to the industry as well. We, we work with loads of different types of people. So um, the, the the value is different for those different people. It's not just new franchisees or leads, or it's it's understanding what they actually that client really is about, what they need, and then giving them a very honest um, ongoing view of what's going on because it's not all going going to go smoothly, and it never does. <laughs> so coming sometimes it's not the problem it's what you come back with that's actually the value so okay. we've just done this campaign this one's worked brilliantly this one's not worked why has that not worked here's a load of ideas as to what we can do next do you want to do those things well yeah i want more franchisees or i want more customers i like your, what you're saying makes sense you've seen that you've analyzed it and you come back to something that i understand why you're saying what you're saying and would like mm -hmm. to invest in that to try that next so we're, we're working as a team with the client, but giving our, our genuine honest advice. And if we've done something wrong, we say we've done something wrong, sorry, you know, yeah. and we try and find a solution for it. So I think, I think that's my, that's, it, it's, it's got to be caring about the, the client and, and yeah. really and understanding what they want and need and their stresses and strains. Yeah. Brilliant. And you mentioned keeping yourselves under, under pressure there. What, what did you mean by that? So we, rightly or wrongly, have always operated with a monthly rolling commitment. So when I say that we've got, this is for the majority of services, some of our services are a bit different because they're like the valuations and 
finding a buyer and stuff is a bit different. But the, yeah. the ongoing, the core marketing and recruitment piece is is largely around a monthly, re, 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 you know, it's it's terms and conditions contracted, but it's a monthly rolling commitment. So if someone doesn't like what they're doing, I've always thought, well, they're just not going to pay, or they're going to say go away, and they're not going to pay, or it's just going to go, it's going to go horribly wrong if you've got a twelve month thing and you've got to try and get the money out. It's just yuck. So I've always thought, well. It's not like a 100% satisfaction guarantee or anything cheesy like that. It's just like, if you don't like working with us, don't work with us. Tell us and we'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds yeah. pretty simple to me. But yeah. the fact yeah. that clients yeah. tend to work for many years would suggest that we obviously are providing that ongoing value. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't work. So I think it's having the faith that you can offer that because I've done that from the beginning. It's like the thing I was talking about with the commissions and the markups. Loads of people have asked me, you know, I'll give you a couple of quid if you sell this to this with these all these clients, and I'm not, I won't do it. And I've there's been some pretty tempting numbers thrown at us, uh, even recently. And I, I know we're an independent company that work with that client as part of their team, giving them the advice and guidance that they need um, to make them successful. So it's, it's not about you know we get our money, we're very transparent, but it's not about us making every little bit we can out of that client. It's it's. Uh, right. It's a nicer relationship than that. And I think that's why the relationships tend to be quite quite long. Very good. Excellent. And any things that you feel that you got wrong? What would you given a given your time again, what would uh, what would you say, you know, well actually that was that was that was a mistake? This is gonna be a very way. ironic answer, but it's marketing. <laughs> Okay. We are like a, a excellent painter and decorator who lives in a house <laughs> that has not been painted and decorated for 20, 30 years. And yeah, yeah. All the paints peeling off the wall. Yeah. Our, our marketing is better because obviously I've now got other people who are who are in the team who are helping do it. But uh, we, 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 if I could go back and be better at that for us, so rather than focusing on everybody else the whole time, actually focus on me and us. Yes. That, that's, um, that's something I would change. But I don't think I'd be me if I did. You know, we wouldn't be where we are. We wouldn't be what we are if I had done that. We would have been more of a traditional sales-led marketing. You know. Yes, and it's and it's always an impossible question anyway. What would you What would you've done differently? Because you know you've done what you've done, and if you if you had all the same information at the <laughs> you'd do the same thing again, wouldn't you? But it, but it's um but it's it's often good to look back and just think you know where where perhaps could we have you know would we have done things differently or or again yes given our given our time again what what might we have done a little bit a little bit differently so you mentioned marketing what this question i like to ask everybody i, I talk to on scale up radio is what does work for you from a from the marketing aspect from the point of view of finding more customers what's what's your secret secret source that works for you um, I don't think it's a particularly um, exciting answer. Um, we we tend to have grown through doing a good job and getting referrals right. from yeah. either yeah. clients or or um, uh, predominantly from um, friendly advisors within the industry, friendly friendly parties in the industry who we we stay in touch with. Um, we're good, honest people. They're good, honest people. You know, if you do a good job, they see you're doing a good job. Other franchisors see you're doing a good good job. Um, for other for other networks, then there's a there's a sort of a it's a relatively small space, and people say these guys are good. What I'd love to do is be a bit more of one of those mouthpieces and do more of this sort of thing and do more videos and tell more of the things that I see that work and I and I think people should do more of to help them. Right. Uh, maybe that's the next stage. Maybe it's to be a bit more um, visible. Uh, I think I've been probably so focused on helping the people I'm helping at that point in time that I don't go out necessarily. Well, we don't go out as a group and necessarily uh, shout about ourselves and shout about what you know how 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 we could potentially help and scale across a, a wider group of people rather than those that we're we're currently looking at at the moment in time. So, yeah, good. So, yeah, so re referrals, recommendations are your key key route at the moment. So. Absolutely, absolutely, and it has been for for the journey. I would say, yeah, generally. all right. And as you as you grow the grow the team and it's no longer you doing it doing it all have your finger on every single bit of the pulse how do you how do you keep control and make sure that things are being done in the right way in the chantry way um, well i don't know how much of a story you want we've, we've been through a, a bit of a journey so just before covid19 hit we um i brought in a, a gentleman uh, as chairman absolute 
legend of a chat. Really lovely guy. We got on really well. We still get on really well. Um, and uh, we put all these business plans in place. It was all very methodically worked out. And uh, he'd been successful previously uh, within franchising. Everyone's going to know who I'm talking about anyway. Um, yep. But uh, uh, um, he, he um, it was just the wrong bloody time. Excuse my French. Well, yes. None of us, none of us, none of us <laughs> we, could have known, really, could we? I invested a lot of money and went for it. And everyone was like, oh, it's just about to end. It's just about to end. It's just about to end. But two years in, I was running out of energy, running out of patience. Money was thin uh, yeah. after spending a lot and cutting a lot from my personal um, lifestyle as well to make it work. Okay. So so I did that and 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 we put a lot of process. So the, one, the good things that came out of that, we put a lot of process in place. We started to build a management team in a part-time way. So we had people, and I love this. This is this is one of the things that I I would I mean I don't I don't know because I've not been bigger as a business yet, but at this stage, it's uh, having spoke to some of the other um people on your smart board um last week, Kevin, for the first time, it feels like we're actually ahead with our structure of a lot of those people. They're making more money. <laughs> we're ahead with spending money. No, we're ahead with our structure. So we've got this management team. Uh, in place and they're so they're doing roles and then they they have their management team senior leadership team role as a an element or percentage of their time so half yeah, a day week, a day a week two days yeah. a week whatever it is yeah, each one's different so we actually have got a management team like a big business bigger yeah. business would have um in our own little small world and that to me has been an absolute you know that's changed the world right because suddenly it's not me and then some people around me it's it's got a structure and we've got processes and the thing that we were missing which we're about to bring in uh, well, i hope you are <laughs> is is all of the um having listened to your book i can recommend kevin brent's book very very insightful um very kind of you thank you <laughs> yeah no it was good and, and I'm, i want to do that process i want to do that so it's to, for me to say that i've had a bit of a bashing the last couple of years with the period as i know a lot of people have in business the period we've been through and um to come out the other side and now be enthusiastic again is a big deal it's a you know it's a, it's it's good so excellent um, good we're, we're heading in the right direction good no very good and i'm going to go back to what you just said actually about people having on the senior leadership team having um time and having specific elements that are their role as being on that senior leadership team because that actually you 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 said it very quickly but it is a really key point and it's a it's a mistake that a lot of businesses make which is you promote up so you know i don't know you've got a let's say you've got a product development team and you you as you grow you need to have a head of product development so to become a head of product development or run and maybe a head of marketing or, or, or whatever but and they become essentially your management team or your senior leadership team but but often the business won't say actually now that you're at that level and you need to have some time or some elements of your job description which are across the whole business to support running the whole business not just in your product delivery or in your marketing silo that you're that, that you're in and and it and it's a key it's a key step because then that means that you actually work as a senior leadership team not as a group of individuals looking after your de your departments and um so yeah i hope people listening have, 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 have picked that up and and you want to identify some of those tasks that are relevant across the team and how you're going to work as a, as a team to really get that team culture going and that of course then helps to take the workload off of you as the business owner and it's not all on your shoulders then to to make that to make that work really good excellent so you mentioned there actually that that um, things got a bit thin from the cash perspective for, for for a while, and that's another challenge, of course, for scaling businesses, keeping control of the of the cash. What sort of what sort of things have you learned or have you put in place to make sure that you are on top of the on, on top of the cash side of the business? Um, well, one of the senior leadership team is is the finance head of finance, yep. so that bringing him in has been uh, a game changer, actually absolute right. game changer so yeah. he, he is um as the accountant said we've actually got rid of the accountant and outsource bookkeeper completely and we've now gone in-house it, it's that okay. he's that strong and the new accountant who um is um just doing the statutory year end stuff mm. we, we have monthly management accounts and i have done for, for a number of years um which are very very important in my opinion the um the the new the new head of finance 
uh, it, it brings a whole other dynamic. You've got someone there, and he's 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 come down to us, so to speak. So he he is capable of more. Um, obviously, don't tell him. He probably won't listen listen to me roughly. He listens to me all day long anyway. So, um, but no, having someone of that level has has taken it, taken it forwards. Um, I think that taking that. So one of the things that I, a great a wise man once said, I think Kevin Brent was the, was the in, in your book. No, you get rid of the task that you're not good at. For, first then yeah. you've got to get rid of the task that you are good at so i i would not profess to be brilliant at financial management i'm probably more in in the marketing and business development sales account should we say yeah. um and i have an understanding which i've developed over time through you know investing in in in, in learning and i think it's really important to a business owner if you have a fear about an area of a business go and learn and get over the fear you don't have to be good at it at the end of it but you need to understand it all and i think i I had that, I don't really get it, feeling about that whole piece. And although I'd done it at university and actually did very well in my grades and things, I never really applied it, never really lived it. So mm-hmm. doing that was was brilliant. So that was a, a big a big change. Um, we always had cash because we made sure that the people I had around me always made sure we were fine. But it was, it, as, as any small business owner who were taking dividends, and affected by the uh, shutdowns from the COVID will have experienced, suddenly you have no money. <laughs> yeah. You can't yeah. take the money. So yeah. it's 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 uh, it's a scary place because um, we, we didn't really get, I, I don't want to turn this into political, uh, thing, <laughs> but we, we didn't really get any help. They, they said, here, have some furlough for your employees. Here, have a loan, which obviously a lot of people took out. Mm. Um, but the businesses that actually suffered now have, all this debt effectively and they didn't have the money during the period so you're on your back foot already and you've now got more debt so you're in a it's a very weird situation to be in to try and recover from and now all the employees have come out of it not employee bashing at all but they understandably have said look you know the costs are going up yeah, and i need yeah. more money otherwise i'll go and yeah. get a job somewhere else um so you're in this really weird position where you've been hammered for two years haven't really been able to take the money that you needed to live so you've probably had to find ways of dealing with that and you've got possibly another loan attached to your business that you didn't have at the outset and and it's not fully recovered either really the world yeah. and 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 then everyone suddenly wants more money and you've got to put your prices up it's quite a weird scenario right now for a business owner kevin <laughs> it, it, it is, and you've just described what it's like for the, yeah for many many thousands of business owners across the country and probably across the you know, largely across the across the globe as as, as well. So, um, how are you how are you going to navigate your way out of that and get get control of the cash side? Do you think? Um, well, we're back in we're back on the right side of it now. Um, so the demand is more stable for us. Uh, recruitment is flying again. So yeah, yeah. Uh, people are recruiting strongly, which means we're getting more money. Because part of the way we structure the business is we suffer if the client's not winning. So if the client's yeah. not winning, we're not winning. Yeah. And obviously, if you add COVID into that mix, it becomes quite a nasty uh, cocktail, which I didn't really see. Well, I don't know if anyone saw coming. Yeah. Um, uh, apart from the creators of some various films uh, at Hollywood <laughs> at some point in the past, maybe some drug company owners. But anyway, um, the, uh, the 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 key uh, thing for for us is to to now make sure that we get the value proposition right. So we get our pricing correct, so yeah. that we are profitable but not too expensive. We need to be affordable for the majority of the clients. So do you, I don't know if you're going to ask me, but in in a few years' time, I'd like to be in a position where we're helping a lot more people. And we've been through stages of growth where we've helped small emerging franchisors, which can need quite a lot of coaching and mentoring because mm-hmm. it's a journey they haven't done and they, they're, they're nervous and there's a lot of money being spent and it takes a long time to get franchisees up to speed and to be actually getting income from them so you're stable. Yeah. So we, we've done that, that space and it's quite hard because I naturally want to try and help everyone and some of those people didn't have the, not enough money and they weren't in a position to really actually succeed so yeah. you, you it's actually better for us as a business to work with the bigger as we are now the, the dyna rods the shell energy the, you know the huge big companies because they've got teams of people they know where they are it's it's they've been there you know it's it, there's budgets there and we can actually make a massive impact when we come right. in to work with them I want to do that with the small guys again. And I feel like we still work with some, but because we're we're obviously an agency with lots of people and, and the overhead of UK staff, we're, we're, we're quite, I wouldn't say expensive, because if you compare us to the cost of employing a person, we're cheaper. So yeah. 
yeah. it would but it, but it's a perception thing isn't there it's an agency outside a person inside yeah. your organization so I, I think we need to either overcome that so that people see us as part of their team and compare us to the cost of employing uh, an individual to do the franchise people the marketing to help with the franchisees etc um or, or, or alternatively we need to try and find some way of scaling that lower value end where i can still we can still help those people um they can still be successful and they can afford in their mind to to, to put that budget to franchise recruitment with a with a with a team of people that, that are from chantry so it's it's finding that 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 sweet spot but in the future i i want to I want to have that nailed uh, and the future being in the next sort of three to six months so that we can really be out there as a solution. Uh, we, I feel we're already the, the leaders. Um, uh, and obviously I'm slightly biased in that kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do feel we're the leaders in, in what we do. We've got the nice, the best, nicest, most switched on commercially astute team of people with all these different areas. And yeah. and I still think we're, we're, we're cheaper than if you were to, to employ someone so, in the house. So, so on that, you, you, Pretty much predicted my next question, but if we sat in in five years' time, then what 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 would you consider success? What what is good? Look yeah, like? so I, I wouldn't be um, uh, probably working in the business at all. I'd be working on the business, which is a weird concept, and I don't know how we get there. Being honest, right now, so I yep. still do quite a lot and help quite a lot in the business, and I like doing that. So it's it's not that I don't want to scale. I want to scale so I can help more businesses, and I think um, having the team run the business and me helping with the team. I mean, there's, as everyone knows, there's not enough time in the day. It would be good to be able to use my, um, my value to help the people that I should be helping with the bits right. that I can really help with rather yeah. than getting bogged down with stuff that is not, it's not, it's not the right place for me, not the right use of my time. So, so looking at what I'd be doing, that's what I'd be doing. I'd be in that position. The team would be running the business. Um, the clients would be um, three or four times the number and be get, all getting value as, as, as we ideally aim to, to have now um, so that we've got this long-term ongoing relationship with the majority. And it would be a real mix from the McDonald's type brands, um, maybe McDonald's, down to the the smaller emerging franchisors who are just starting out. So we're helping across the the, the mix with with a whole range of different services for those different um, brands. As as they, I mean, it's a small industry, so I think yep. yeah. But we don't want to take over. We've got our thing. We do what we do. I'm not trying to go and find loads of other service services to sell. We do what we do. We want to do that well for more yep. people, help more people with what we do. Perfect. Great. Well, I think we've had a. I think we had a really good conversation. Lots of really good insights and takeaways from me, Chris. So thank you very much for that. I've got you're right for a little quick fire question. Just just a couple, couple of questions, quick fire round. So one of those sort of asked it a bit earlier, but if you could go back to your younger you, what would your advice be to young Chris? Just don't be afraid. Just go and carry on doing what you listen to your gut. Do it. Just do it. No. Follow very it. Good. Follow your gut feel. Very good. Apart from Scale Up Radio and um, the Entrepreneur Scale Up System, what what books or podcasts would you uh, would you recommend? Do you... Um, well, the most recent um, uh, I use Audible. The most recent ones that I I would recommend um, are Kevin Brent's Scale Up book. Genuinely, I've listened to that one and a half times. Which anyone knows me, I'm not really into reading or listening to books, so that's an impressive feat. Um, and the other one, which I've absolutely love and I still haven't finished yet, is Profit First. And Profit I need first, to talk yeah. about that separately. Profit By First. Mike, Mike Michalowicz. Yeah. Brilliant. Mm. Very good. Um, what what sort of apps do you have maybe on your phone or maybe that you use in the business that have made a difference for, for, for you? Um, I'm going to have to look now. <laughs> what apps have I got that made a difference? So we use Monday.com Monday, as right, a time management tool, which is really yeah. good. Um, yeah. Uh, we've tried loads of different ones over the years, literally loads, and, and Monday stuck for a couple of years. Brilliant. Monday.com. Good. Excellent. Um, and um, we've already, you've already said that your most successful marketing tactic is your referral side of things. Yep, so referral marketing. So really good advice there. Thank you very much. And if people would like to get hold of you or, or your team, what's the best way for them to do that, Chris? Um, so if they, if you want to have a chat around what Chantry do and what they offer, I'm proud to say that I'm not the only person that talks about it these days. Um, there's some guys that are far more um, fun to talk to than me. <laughs> um, so I would suggest going to the website, uh, go to our, our website, which is chantry.group. 
and uh, you just send an inquiry from there or give us a ring from the, uh, the phone number on there. If you want to talk to me directly or have anything that you'd like to, to do with myself, I'd suggest my LinkedIn, uh, which is Chris Cook QFP. Um, is how you'd find me. There's quite a few different Chris Cooks in the world. Some of them are bodybuilders. Some of them uh, play rugby uh, internationally. There's all sorts. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm Chris Cook QFP. Yeah, brilliant. And those in the industry will will know what the QFP stands for. Do you want to just say for those that don't? Um, so it's Qualified Franchise Professional. Um, and I actually, I train uh, the course as well and train the most people in, in the area that uh, is franchise recruitment and franchise development. To supposedly know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Chris, thank you very much indeed for being my guest on Skelet Radio today. Thank you very much, Kevin. I hope you enjoyed that discussion. And if you're building and scaling your own business, you might well be interested in our book, The Entrepreneurial Scale-Up System. And it's exactly what it says on the tin. It's a practical handbook around scaling a business in a structured way. And you can order a copy on all your favorite online retailers, including an audio version, or you can find it and other supporting resources on our website, www.esusgroup.co.uk. That's esusgroup.co.uk, which is E-S-U-S-G-R-O-U-P.co.uk. This has been a Monkey Pants Productions podcast.